Hello, and uh, welcome to this Adam Smith Institute webinar. My name is Eamon Butler. We're here today to look at the ideas and contemporary relevance of the novelist, commentator, and philosopher Ayn Rand, who was born on this day in 1905. Rand is best known for her novels At the Shrugged and The Fountainhead, which bring millions of young people uh, towards the ideas of freedom and rational self-interest. Indeed, she developed uh, an entire philosophy called objectivism on these principles. Rand was born in St. Petersburg, but migrated to the United States soon after the creation of the Soviet Union. As well as her novels and her philosophy, she became well known in America as a commentator on current issues such as the Vietnam War, the Middle East conflict, uh, sexual politics, and student unrest. So what might Rand's ideas teach us uh, about our own issues today? Issues such as uh, lockdowns, free speech, the cancel culture, uh, identity politics, and the statue wars. Uh, with me to discuss the question are three experts. We have Tara Smith, who is a philosopher at the University of Texas and the author of many books and articles about Rand's philosophy of objectivism. Her main focus is on values, virtues, and the demands of objective law. Thomas Walker is a fellow and editor of the uh, Objective Standard Institute and assistant editor of the journal, The Objective Standard. He's collaborated on research projects here at the Adam Smith Institute as well. Tom Burrows has been a financial journalist for over three decades and is group editor of Wealth Briefing, covering the global wealth management sector. Ayn Rand is one of several thinkers who have influenced him. So I'm gonna start by asking our guests uh, to say, just in a, a couple of uh, minutes, what Ayn Rand means to them, and then we can move on to a, a broader discussion of her relevance to the world today. So Tara Smith, uh, what uh, does Ayn Rand mean to you? Hey, let me start the video. Let me actually begin just with two preliminaries. First, I do want to thank you very much, Eamon and the Institute, for holding this event and for inviting me to be a participant. I should also say I speak for myself today. I'm not a representative of the University of Texas. I'm not here as a representative of ARI, the Ayn Rand Institute. I just speak for myself. Um, I'm not sure if this directly answers what she means to me, but in thinking of all of the influences that Rand's thought has had on me, I'll just focus on two dimensions today. One is I was struck from early on by how important she regarded it to state exactly what we mean when we speak to identify exactly what a position is, what the implications are. She's a great practitioner of calling it like she sees it, of naming things for what they are. So this is something in her approach really that I think is quite valuable and that a lot of people will comment on when they first read Rand, when they get beyond the fiction and read some of her nonfiction essays, she's bracing, she's really refreshing because She's nailing the principles of things. She's not simply engaging in the usual qualifications and hedging. She's not afraid of black and white. Now this turns some people off, but really it's not just stylistic. She's getting to the heart of an issue. She's getting to the principle of things. She never met a euphemism that she could abide because she realized that fudging things fakes things and doesn't really help anybody understand what we need to. So she was very forthright, direct, pressed on what needs to be understood on an issue. If she was being interviewed, it wouldn't occur to her to water down her views a little bit, make them more palatable, make the audience like her. She wasn't trying to be a rebel, I think, but she took ideas really seriously and she spoke up to her audiences. She spoke to our intelligence. And I think that in itself is very refreshing. But the second point I'll focus on today is a more substantive point, and this is her individualism, her commitment to the individual, to egoism. 
I love her unapologetic embrace of the idea that your life is yours unconditionally, without qualification. Each person is an end in himself. We often say that when we're trying to explain why you should respect the rights of others, and you should, but if each person is an end in himself, that means you are too, and you should treat your own life in that way. And you should do all you can to try to make your life as good and as rich as it can be. So she held a real reverence for human living. And this very much comes through in her fiction, which I'd recommend. But human living doesn't come in a six pack. It's individual, it's one by one. And here again, let me just tie this up with the point about her language and her naming things for what they are. When she collected some of her essays on ethics and gave it the title, The Virtue of Selfishness, that was the book title. You know, a lot of people said, oh my God, why are you using that horrible word selfishness? That's just gonna alienate people. It's just gonna turn them off and so on. But again, she realized selfishness is what I'm talking about and what we all need to think about. So it's a nice example of her naming things for what they are and getting to the heart of issues that we do need to confront. So that's a lot of her legacy for me. Um, yes, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, on this subject, I mean, political activists uh, today um, say that recognizing people's group identity is important in order to understand their, their particular problems and to treat them fairly. What would, what would Rand have said to that, uh, given her, her philosophy of individualism? She would have disagreed, and she did disagree. <laughs> and she disagreed in print, and she has an essay called Racism, which speaks about these kinds of issues. I mean, it's not only about race relations, but in her time in the 60s, she was writing. And she calls this kind of what, what today more broadly is identity politics. Among other things, it's such an insult to the individual to see him or to encourage people to see themselves as merely members of groups, the inheritors of the accidents of birth. I, I happen to be a white woman. That's, you know, that wasn't a choice. I am, uh, you know, but that was a matter of accident, right? But what the identity politics mentality says is, of all the things you've said and done and thought over the course of your decades now, Tara, what's important about you is this thing that you just happen to, well, you happen to be born of, you know, white parents and, and a woman. It's, I mean, it's stupid. It's anti-intellectual. It's deterministic. I mean, she has a lot to say about this. I don't want to hog the time too much. I'm sure we'll get into it more in the discussion. But she was very much against that idea that it's the group, particularly accidental groups that you happen to belong to that make you, you. Very good, all right. Well, let's, uh, thank you very much. Let's move on to uh, uh, Thomas Walker. Uh, Thomas, um, what does Ayn Rand mean to you? Um, so, yeah, I, I've, I wouldn't be here where I am today doing the things I do today without her ideas, without her. Um, I think before she came, so if you go back to 2013, before I discovered Rand and discovered her ideas, um, I, I was in a, a, sort of a, a floating place. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. What I, wanted. I was doing a PhD in a subject that didn't interest me at all. And um, I think I was doing that out of a sense of needing to prove myself to other people. Uh, and then, you know, university had finished. My friends had largely moved away. I, I, I was just, I, I had no real social contact. I had, I had no direction. And she came along and transformed my life in two really important ways. Firstly, she made it clear that it's okay for me to want what I want for myself uh, and do what I need to do to get that. So I think part of why I was staying in university was to avoid work. I didn't want to get a traditional job. And, um, Rand changed my notion of what work means. In, instead of being a thing that you do for somebody else, it became a thing you do, I think I do for myself. And um, I, I discovered the idea that I can have the lifestyle I want. I just have to do the work for it. Um, the, the proverb she always quotes is take what you want and pay for it. You know, um, so not only do, did she give me that idea that it's okay for me to want a certain life for myself, 
but the, if I work hard enough and treat work as being about me, not about other people, then I can actually get that and earn it and deserve it. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with being self-interested. So that was the one really big thing she did for me. The other was that she tied together so many of what I thought were disparate opinions on disparate issues. So I had, I had existing opinions on, you know, how government should be run and how education should be run, how transportation should be run, uh, as well as ethical opinions about, you know, how we should interact with other people. I saw all of these as separate things. She, in, in one interview, in, in her Mike Wallace interview you can find on YouTube, uh, she just tied all of that together into one integrated philosophic system that you know, doesn't just tie together my ideas about society and about politics, but about how to live my own life. And, and she introduces that idea that all of that is integrated. One philosophic system can answer all of your questions about not just about politics, but about lifestyle as well. The same principles apply throughout. So yeah, just I, I would not be doing the things I, I do today. I wouldn't have a job like this. I wouldn't have the friends I have, the relationships I have. I wouldn't be able to travel the way I do. It, she just opened so many doors for me in changing my way of thinking about life, thinking about work, thinking about everything. Uh, uh, Thomas, does it uh, sort of concern you that um, uh, Rand, if you like, as we've heard, offers this, this coherent uh, view on life. And actually, as you get older, you think, no, uh, things aren't all that rule driven. In fact, there's all sorts of exceptions come and go. Uh, do you think that, that her appeal is really for young people and that as you go on in life, you realize that, well, there are exceptions to these rules or, or do you think it's something that goes with you through your life? I'm I certainly, so objectivism, in my experience at least, isn't about rules. It's, it's about recognizing the reality of the world around us and, and acting in accordance with that. So, you know, it's not, a, it's not like a religion. It, it won't say you must do this. It's not you must be selfish. It's if you want to succeed, if you want to have a good life, and if you want people to have good lives, then these are the ideas we should follow to, to achieve that. And, and the world is integrated. You know, we, we live in a real world, you know, I say governed, but you know, physical laws exist, things act in a certain way. The same is true for all sorts of things. You know, if, if you lie about things, then you know, if you're dishonest with yourself, then um, you won't succeed. It's, it's, there, there's, a, there's a cause and effect aspect to that. So it's not about following rules and being rigid with yourself like that. It's about recognizing the real world around you and acting in a way that will actually get you good results as a result of that. So it's, it's it's not it's not about rules and in terms of older and younger people i, I i've not seen any evidence in, in the objectivists i know that there's a particular disparity one way or the other there's a hell of a lot of old people there's a hell of a lot of younger people and i think if anything socially there's a tendency for younger people to buy into more socialist ideas and then experience the real world and realize that doesn't work in, in real life when you get into the workplace so if anything it's probably the opposite Oh, all right, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Very good. Um, uh, now, Tom, uh, Tom Burrows, um, how did you get into RAN? What's RAN mean to you? Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me onto the, this panel today, uh, Eamon. And uh, I, I, should, I should add, I, I need to sort of do a little disclaimer just in case my colleagues all jump up and down. Um, I'm speaking for myself, uh, uh, but uh, um, I'll just make that point. But how do I, um, what, what does Ayn Rand mean to me and how did, and how did I get to this point? Um, well, actually, just, just I came to across Rand in my late teens, early 20s when I was an undergraduate and I'd already formed some views about how I saw the world. And it's fair to say that I probably was already on the track of what might be called classical liberalism uh, by that point. Um, this was the mid-1980s. Uh, mid um, unless you were completely blind, you were aware of the, the problems of uh, of, of, of socialism, we had a minor strike, we had the uh, uh, the imminent demise of the former Soviet Union and all that sort of thing going on. Um, and I'd already, and I'd come across writing some people like uh, various other sort of free market economists at the time. So I was already pretty much on track towards many of the views that the course that she also subscribes to. But um, I remember picking up um, a book, uh, the one about the anti-industrial um, book, book, the book about the new left, and although it was not a great shock to me when I read it, uh, like Tara, I was struck by the sheer 
diamond hard clarity of how she wrote and how directly how she wrote. And that really did make me uh, sit up and take notice. And what really appeals to me about Rand, um, and I, I, th I would echo what uh, others have said, but a point that I would particularly make is I like the way that she approaches knowledge as something that is hierarchical, that you have to have foundations, that those foundations must be got right. Um, and that if you don't get them right, you can get yourself into all kinds of problems later on. So in that sense, I think I like the, uh, that this is to some, to some extent her Aristotelian roots, uh, which continue. And I saw that was something that really struck me. I also really like the fact, and again, I'm, I'm taking on from what others have said, is that she made it clear that the pursuit of one's rational, long-term self-interest is not just something that is wise, or efficacious, but that it is it is good, uh, that is morally right, that your own life, your life is yours, and your happiness is, and your flourishing as a human being is yours to pursue, are things which you should not apologize for, and indeed you should regard almost like a, your own sacred duty to yourself. And I didn't come across anyone else who'd make those points in quite the same way as, as she did. And I, they stay with me as much as they do when I was a, a callow 20 year old uh, in Brighton Polytechnic in the UK. Um, and I also was struck by the fact about how she addressed the issue of what she called altruism and the idea that there is something, if you think about it, remarkably um, odd about the idea that it's better, is good to give up a greater value for a lesser one. And when thinking it through like that, why would any sane person, including those who wish to receive the benefits of, of, of philanthropy wish to be in that situation. And I think coming from that, and this is a point we may get on to later, is I was struck by how, and she also illustrated this in her novels, about how people who are motivated by rational self-interest don't look at, regard other people as a threat, as predators, but actually in such an environment will develop benevolent and entirely agreeable um, relations with others with whom they transact on that basis. And I even see echoes of that in some of the ideas, um, albeit in a different form, from Adam Smith's first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and the idea that a certain natural sympathy um, builds up amongst people who treat people on the basis of rational self-interest. Of course, uh, she took a different um, tack to this than Adam Smith uh, in terms of being so direct uh, in her support, the idea of, of pursuing one's rational self-interest as a good. I also enjoyed, amongst other things, her insights about art, even though I didn't necessarily agree with all of her choices, but I thought her understanding about what uh, romantic realism was, and even some of her, her ideas about how romantic realist art continues in bootleg forms in popular culture was really an eye-opener. And uh, I remember an old friend of mine um, a libertarian called Chris Artane once telling me that one of his regrets about Ayn Rand is he never quite got the point of Elvis Presley, but that he would hope that he would eventually have brought her around. All right. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Um, you mentioned uh, human flourishing. Uh, just very quickly, very quickly. Um, we're all going stir crazy now with lockdowns. Um, yes. These are imposed by the state, um, and Rand thought the state was too powerful. But in an emergency like this, don't you need some kind of different rules to do the everyday normal circumstances apply anymore? Or do you need to do something else that isn't libertarian, isn't liberal? Yeah, this is this is actually a really uh, a controversial area for a lot of people, because I know a lot of people who subscribe to our broadly our sort of classical free, free market ideas have often been on both sides of this argument, often quite heated. Um, to quote from Rand herself, an emergency is an unchosen, unexpected event, limited in time, that means you, Boris, limited in time that creates conditions under which human survival is impossible, such as a flood, an earthquake, a fire, a shipwreck. She didn't mention a pandemic, but I can assume that, that we can assume fairly that it does include a pandemic. Now, an important point that she made in her, her essay, um, The Ethic of Emergencies, which is on page 43 of my book, a copy of The Virtue of Selfishness, available at all good bookstores and via uh, social various platforms, is that 
emergencies just to repeat are limited in time they are they're meant to be hopefully brief events they are not the normal run of events and she she argued that um the, the basis for morality has to be based on the on, on normal uh, run of events and that so-called uh, lifeboat uh, situations uh, extreme type situations that some moral eth uh, ethicists sometimes bring up to describe uh, certain moral situations um, are, are, are missing the point because if you need lifeboat eth uh, situations to give you some kind of moral guidance you're looking in the wrong place i think looking at the say the situation with the pandemic that we have today and, uh, and the effect it has on human flourishing or rather crushing it is she would for example have and I, I can't I can't completely second guess what she would have said but she would have wanted any uh, way of tackling something as horrible as what we've been through as to be done in a way that is as congruent as possible with in protecting or at least not aggressing unduly against human liberty and uh, would have wanted for example um uh, the the enforcement of any of any controls to be done in ways that spoke to the need to protect life and 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 protect and therefore protect people's or, autonomy and she would have uh, presumably have been very um, conscious of the debates about the need to have a proper cost benefit analysis of of uh, of of an, a measures taken to deal with particular threat in the same way that if say the pandemic had been a or, or, or some other threat had been uh, th thrown at us, whether it be military or somehow, she would uh, have uh, made those points as well. She, for example, was opposed to conscription in the military, which gives you some idea about how she would have addressed the role of the state in effectively conscripting all of us into dealing with something like, like COVID-19. Mm. Uh, well, let me bring in the, uh, our other uh, panellists uh, now, um, because uh this thing about emergencies is really quite quite interesting i feel and i just wondered if um <clears throat> tara or uh or thomas you, you might have uh some thoughts on emergencies because i mean an emergency yes is something limited in time but it's going on a long long time and in the meantime of course we have state control over much of our lives for a very long period so I wonder what the uh, um, Tara and, and Thomas think okay. about that. Okay, I mean, I have oh, yeah. there you go. Okay. Uh, a couple of things. Yeah, emergencies are different from the normal course of events and she addressed this and she thought some abnormal, uh, both just morally speaking, some abnormal expectations should come into play during truly extraordinary situations. And when we're talking about government, politically, there are differences too. Typically, and the kinds of examples that she gave of emergencies, they are short-lived. They are of limited duration. However, something like an infectious disease that has gotten all around the globe, we can't just say, well, you know, time's up. I mean, we have to deal from the reality of the nature of this emergency. So I don't think we, you know, you can artificially impose, you get two months if you're a disease, but that's it. No, I mean, you have to be realistic to the circumstances. However, emergency powers on the part of government, that's not carte blanche, anything goes. Oh, it's an emergency. So the government now has the, and Rand would not have thought this, now the government has the authority to lock you down in whatever way, shape, form, or whatever duration it chooses. What, I mean, what we've seen in the United States, in the UK, and in many places, not all, is really ham-handed, arbitrary uses and abuse of government authority. I do think government, and I think Rand thought, government authority in an emergency is different, and they might have more powers than they would normally have. But that doesn't mean they have all powers. But the fact that some of the lockdowns have been, that the authority to lock down has been misused shouldn't be taken to indict the legitimacy of some government imposition in order to, to help to do its job. The government's job is to protect our rights. If other people are knowingly threatening, or even unknowingly in some cases, really threatening our health in the very serious ways that COVID can, it is for the government to place some restrictions that would not normally uh, be appropriate. 
Um, there's a couple of other points I think to make as well is that um, what we're describing here is not a new thing that came along with COVID. Um, this is something that really has been an issue in our society since 9-11 um, because the emergency of terrorism has been used to justify enormous expansion in state of state power in the US and the UK and throughout a lot of the Western world. So, um, you know, and, and there is no end date to, to those powers. Like, you know, we have this alert system in this country of, of you know, the terror threat alert level. And it's always a, either imminent or high. It's now, it, when is it gonna be at low? And then when, when do we say, you know, okay, we don't need terror, you know, we don't need to have barriers up and down in front of parliament anymore. When, when do we say that's gone away? And so it, we don't have that sense of, you know, a, a emergency being contained. It becomes the status quo and the government just moves on. And that, that's what they've been doing for hundreds of years, frankly, is, you know, even income tax was a wartime emergency measure and it's still with us 100, 150 years later. So that, that's been a long running problem. Also on the, um, the, well, firstly, COVID is a question of scale. Um, you know, every year we accept the fact that a certain number of people are going to contract and die from the regular flu. Uh, at the same time, if there was a worldwide Ebola outbreak and we're in a situation where anyone who catches this disease is almost certainly gonna die from it, we would clearly need action. There needs to be a sense of proportion about the scale of the threat from a pandemic versus the scale of the damage that the restrictions you put in place to control it are going to cause. That has not happened at all in this case. You know, there's been very, very little real assessment of the real harms, not just the lockdowns due to people, mental health, misdiagnoses, all that, the economic harm and the job loss and the suicides and all of that. Also, the consequences for liberty in the long run, what that will do to our society. 10, 20, 30 years from now, just as we've seen from 9-11 on the terrorism front. So that's needed badly and that hasn't happened. Can I, can I add one thing just to pick up? And I think you make some very good points there, um, Thomas. Uh, one of the things that's so disturbing about the lockdowns is the ordinary citizenry's reaction. There's been a lot of acquiescence. Yeah. Of course, right. there are protests and protesters who get a lot of attention, but Tell us what to do, government. I think what we've been seeing, and true, since 9-11, I mean, at least since 9-11, as uh, Thomas Walker reminds us, is this is what the nanny state gets you, right? This is what a government that coddles us and is paternalistic, and you've had that in the UK, and I've had that in the US, right? Generations are raised on, well, the government will tell us what to do and what we may do and may not do. So there's been this, okay, just this, sort of passivity, the meekness of lambs, which is a real sign of how the mentality, uh, it, that people's mentality of dependence on the state, how far and why that has penetrated people's consciousness. Can I just um, make a brief point? Uh, well, uh, can, I, can I just move, move on, uh, uh, Tom? Um, one of the things about the, <coughs> the lockdown is, there have been a, a number of uh, people who have objected to it and so on. And one of the casualties of all this episode has been free speech, uh, that um, there's been calls to silence people who are perhaps anti-vaccine um, or they believe that lockdowns are, are a piece of nonsense and don't work. Um, so what does Rand say about the morality of silencing people who's uh, views, not just that you disagree with, but might actually be damaging to the entire population. What, what, what does she say about that, do you think? Who'd well, like to go? <laughs> yeah, Dara, <if> you're on. <laughs> okay. Um, she was a staunch advocate of freedom of speech. As long as your speech does not infringe on anybody else's rights, you should be free, you should be legally protected to say whatever you like, however offensive it is to some people, as long as you are not infringing on others' rights. Now, if you're engaging in fraudulent speech, if you are knowingly trying to misrepresent a product that I wanna to sell to Tom Burroughs, right? That's not protected because that would be a violation of his rights. If I am uh, recklessly endangering public safety or inciting violence or libeling or slander. I mean, those kinds of things, because they are an infringement of others' rights, you should not be free, in her view, to say those. But within the bounds of respecting others' rights, 
including disagreeing about theory, including disagreeing about vaccines. You should have the right to express your, excuse me, crackpot views about vaccines, right? You don't have the right to stop me from getting one if I can get one of these bloody COVID vaccines and so on. Um, so again, let me not go on too long for now so that others can, can weigh in here, but you know, we can come back if you want. Yeah, I, I, I certainly wouldn't put um, being an anti-vaxxer and being a lockdown skeptic in the, in the same bucket. Because uh, you know, one of those is is a, a very extreme view, and like if if and then the other is quite rational, I think. So if if you're gonna you know deny the Holocaust or deny the moon landings, you know hold views that are clearly nonsense. You know you you should be free to do that, but then everybody else needs to be just as free to criticize you back. That's how ideas get discussed in in a in a functioning, healthy society. We've seen this recently, I think, um, with the Trump movement and other things. If you suppress certain ideas long enough, they grow stronger underground. The fact you're suppressing them makes, gives, lends them legitimacy. So, you know, if, if, if the government or, you know, others start suppressing, you know, anti-vaxxers as, as a viewpoint, that starts to lend credence to the idea they might be onto something. They're clearly not. So, you know, letting these ideas run free in society is is positive and healthy uh, like like tara says you know the only limitation on that is, is when you are actively intentionally doing that to defraud or harm other people and, and an, another example of that in addition to the fraud thing is is literal incitement to violence you know if you go up on a podium and say we should murder all you know homosexuals or whatever that that is an abuse of rights but but to go up on a stadium and say you know being gay is evil it's clearly a stupid view but it's not something you should be prevented from saying. Um, Tom, I've got, a, I've got a question for you, Tom, uh, unless you really want to come back on this one, but uh, somebody's written in, and, and I, I should say, um, please use the, the question and answer uh, button uh, because you can uh, uh, send in some questions for the panel. I've got a few uh, here in front of me now. Um, and one of them, uh, Tom, I think is probably uh, uh, very much directed at you because um, another casualty of uh, all of this uh, uh, antivirus policy uh, has been that uh, we're spending money like water and running up an enormous debt. Um, so the questioner, it's uh, Jenny Habib, uh, says, um, uh, does any of Rand's monetary theory suggest a way out of our problems without raising taxes on companies that are already severely affected by lockdown? So does Rand have anything to say about that? And do you have anything to say about that? I, I, oh, with which Tom was that directed to? Uh, Tom, you're Thomas, he's Tom. <laughs> yes, I'm the, I'm the more vulgar version. Um, I don't, uh, as far as I know from anything I've, re I've, re I've read of by, by Rand or indeed the close associates, I don't recall her uh, making any specific proposals about how a government which has got itself in a horrific amount of debt, such as, as would have been the case after the Second World War, and she would obviously would have been uh, read, followed the news afterwards, uh, have, have said about what to do about it, other than that the government shouldn't be... Or, government shouldn't be in all of these areas of activity in the first place um so in terms of uh, if she was looking at the situation we've got ourselves in today and bear in mind of course that public spending has been running out of control long before anyone had heard of the uh, covid19 um the u.s uh, public debt was already 22 trillion dollars and, and rising before uh this event and the situation in, in in much of the rest of the world is not much better she would have said, uh, she would, I'd imagine she said the problem is, is that the state is so widely involved in so many areas of life anyway, and that needs to get out of it. Um, in terms of the monetary side of it, um, given that she was a, a supporter of hard money, um, although not the specifics of a gold standard, but she did support ideas about uh, getting the state out of the business of the monetary system at all, other than to uphold laws of property and uh, uh, prevent fraud and so on she would have seen the way that the central banks have tried to immunize the huge amounts of debt through quantitative easing or printing money in plain language as something that was bound to go very badly wrong at some point. Uh, you could argue that some of the speculative nonsense that's been going on in the stock market is just a symptom of, um, 
of that. Uh, so she she would have she would have said that the the verities of uh, hard money and getting the state back out of uh, so many areas of life is what would need to happen. Of course, the practicalities of doing that is not necessarily something that she would have. Um, I don't know. I don't know anything she 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 actually ever said about how a state that gets itself so badly mired in such activity unmires itself. But she would certainly have called for a huge retrenchment of the state um, and would have said that the sooner this that, that, that process happens, the better, because obviously it gets much more difficult the further down the line you go. Um, Tom, uh, while, while you're on, uh, we've got a question from Mary Claude uh, Hemming. Uh, would Rand have advocated long, a long-term furlough, as we've had in this country, uh, or some other alternative investment in people? Well, I mean, given that lots of people who are furloughed are perfectly able to do other forms of productive activity during even during a lockdown, just assuming that you think lockdowns are justified. I mean, let's just hold park that to one side. Assuming you think lockdowns are a way to deal with something like this, or maybe the, the least, the only way you can deal with it, and that you have a large number of people placed on furlough, I would, I mean, assuming it couldn't be done in a way that's contractually uh, okay with the employers in question, and uh, of course, she, she would have had a problem, A, with the state, i.e. taxpayers' money being uh, used for furlough. So if the, if the furlough was, was not involved in that, then she would have um, may have said that there, there, there should be ways that people could um, be, pr pr be productively in, um, engaged. Of course, if it's an emergency measure akin to wartime and you have people locked down and then there's, some of them are placed into furlough as part of that, I suppose the issue, therefore, is, is to what extent is uh, the spending on furlough akin to, say, spending on military activity during a war, in which case, it's again, it's not clear to me exactly what the boundaries are, given the context, given the of her own philosophy. I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. Tara, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, where does the, the state start and the individual end, or...? <laughs> That's a silly question. Okay. The state, they get the guns, <laughs> the, state gets the handcuffs. But in all seriousness, the state can say, do this, Eamon Butler, or else you will be fined. We will take your money, your property, or we will imprison you. The private individual, the private company doesn't get to do that. It says, take these terms or not or leave them you know take it or leave it here's the job offer here's the salary or the wage that we're offering and so on but you know we're not going to go after you if you don't like this deal we're just offering you a deal so when it comes back to furloughs and so on it's for companies to decide you know whether or not it makes sense for them to put their employees on furlough if they can afford to to try to continue to pay those people as much as they can because let's say they they like their staff they want those people back they want to treat them well. They genuinely respect a lot of their employees. Moreover, they want to maintain good bonds with them such that when situation, the situation is much better, the economy is healthier, they can bring those people back. But that's a decision right? for private companies, be it a mom and pop two person shop or a large company and so on. It's not the government's job. When you, when you think about a war, that's very, I mean, waging a just war, waging a justified war, that's within the province of a government that's dedicated to protecting our rights. But I don't have a right to an income. I don't have a right to a certain minimum property from others. I mean, that was very much Rand's view, such that a horrible thing happens, a devastating emergency, a pandemic or something else, it's not the role of government to help me. I would just add to that as well. That I, I think throughout this pandemic, there's been a lot of attributing to the virus itself, things that are actually the actions of the state. And so a, the, a lot of the economic harm is not a result of the virus causing people to interact less, it's a result of government locking us down. So if government takes action that harms your business, they have much more of a responsibility to do something about that than they do if the virus, if some natural event harms your business. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you, you can be insured for that kind of thing. But you know, so if, if businesses are failing because of a natural event or because of their own mismanagement, that's no business of government to involve themselves in that. If government's taken action that's completely strangled your business and prevented you from functioning, then I think there's a reasonable case for saying the government should be acting to keep you afloat in that situation. But I, think you make a, I think you make a fair and important point that so many government actions have exacerbated 
the costs of this whole thing. I mean, the pandemic alone, the health conditions created, I mean, they, they made a lot of loss necessary, but the, re, let's just say, the really poor reactions of so many governments locally and federally around have made it all much, much worse. And that does alter the responsibility somewhat, yeah. Um, Tom, um, uh, we, we've got a, a question here from Ananya Chatterjee uh, saying, you know, what, what about companies that, uh, that rely on government tax subsidies and uh, aren't, aren't we doing the wrong thing there, that they're focusing upwards towards government and not, not towards their staff and their, and their customers? Are we creating trouble for ourselves, do you think? I do think, in a, as a general observation, it is worrying, and it actually speaks to also the point about welfare that Tara made about a little while ago, that if you have an, a, um, so many parts of the economy where they're reliant on these kind of subsidies, and it's going it, to become addictive, uh, people get to like it. Um, just to take an anecdotal example, I've, I know quite a lot of people have been on furlough, and I read stories about how some of them, particularly in the, during the first lockdown when the weather was nice, when the whole thing seemed a bit novel, excuse the pun, not, not that they were actually enjoying themselves, but there were quite a lot of examples of people, particularly those who were in white collar jobs who could easily work from home, or at least they had resources, um, that you, I got, a, I got an early inkling that there was a problem building up, that it would be quite hard to persuade people to frankly roll their sleeves up and get back into a more normal environment. So I do worry about the aspects of that. I think there is a, that is not good. And I think the spirit of uh, self-reliance can be quite quickly attenuated and eroded if these things go on for more than a very brief period of time. Of, of course, it, the context does matter. So I, 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 do, I do think there's a problem with this, um, particularly if it's, heavily, if it's done very much through uh, the state. And I think it's, it all comes all too easy for a finance minister like our own to say, oh, we're going to extend furloughs to this date, to this date, to this date. And um, there doesn't appear, at least to people, to be any immediate consequences for this. Uh, I see this as being a very dangerous step. Um, Gail Packett asks us, um, what do you think Rand would say to a potential mandatory COVID uh, vaccine passport, so to speak, to board an aircraft or do something like that where you might be putting other people at risk? What, uh, maybe Tara, that might be one for you. I'm not sure offhand, okay? I'd wanna think this through a little bit further. Um, a couple of things though. On the one hand, private airlines could make whatever policies they would have the right to make whatever policies they wanted as, you know, but I do think just as there can be legitimately, I think government imposed border checks for certain kinds of diseases of people entering a country Comparable to that, I think it can make sense for there to be government restrictions, at least for a temporary period of an emergency on who can come and go in a country, you know, that are based on, again, proportionate to the actual danger from the actual people who you're limiting and so on. Um, but I'd want to think through that policy. I'd need to think that through more, more fully. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, if, if, I mean, so controlling people coming in is one thing in, in terms of security. When your government starts controlling your ability to leave the country, you're drifting into totalitarianism <laughs> at that point. So you know, if, if you're under a legal system and you can't get out, uh, and again, you know, there, there may be emergency situations, very constrained ones where that's justifiable. I'm, I don't believe we were in one, honestly. But, um, but you know, that, that, that's a much bigger problem when, when they're trying to control your ability to leave their control and go elsewhere. I certainly agree with that, but uh, I think the British government's view is that <clears throat> well, we're going to stop uh, people from leaving because they're going to come back again, right? They're going to go away on holiday or on business or whatever, and then they'll, they'll be coming back and they may be bringing the, the virus back. So in these odd circumstances, is there perhaps a case for exit visas, so to speak? I mean, I wouldn't say so, because you, you, if you need to control coming in, you can control coming in. So I don't see any reason to be controlling going out. I think you, know, you should be able to, even, even if we accept the principle that there's a justification for controlling international travel during, during this pandemic, you know, it should be a case of you go out and it's up to the country you're going to, you know, how, whether they want to let you in or not. And then if you want to come back or not, you've 
taken that risk going out knowingly. Another uh, amusing thing, which has uh, amused the, the, the British nation certainly, um, has been uh, the attempts of the European Union to um, um, prevent Britain from getting lots of vaccine that it thinks that it's uh, signed up for. Um, and in the wider world, there, there are larger issues about um, trade with, with China and things like that. Um, Rand thought that, that war could sometimes be justified, but only in self-defense. So let me ask all of you, um, is, is, it, is, war, is a trade war justified, um, you know, for example, with, with China um, for self-defense purposes? Can, can I jump in on this quickly and, um, and draw, draw, I think, an important distinction? Uh, so trade is between individuals and businesses, not between states. China is an exception to that. There is not really such a thing as a Chinese company. Like every business in China is owned or controlled to some degree by the state, almost exclusively. There's varying degrees of that. But if you trade with a Chinese business, you're essentially trading with an arm of the Chinese government. That's a very different situation to trading with a business that's in Belgium or Germany or the US or somewhere like that. So in terms of, of the vaccine nationalism question, yeah, a private company that makes a vaccine has the right to sell that to whomever they want to. You know, if it's made in your country, it doesn't mean it should be used in your country. The company that's produced it has the right to make that decision. And in the case of AstraZeneca, you know, they entered into a, a contract with the UK government well before they did with the EU. So I agree with their assessment that their uh, duty to, to that contract comes first. But, you know, fundamentally, no, trade wars shouldn't happen. Tra trade should be between individuals and businesses across borders freely. The only caveat I would put on that is when you have a communist dictatorship like you have in China that controls those businesses and uses them as means of espionage and, and manifesting state power. I think that's a different situation and security questions come into play there. Okay, here's another one from uh, Kenneth Beitler. Uh, what would Rand have thought about statist tech executives? Who'd like to have a shot on that one? I don't like statists. Doesn't matter if they're, I, I mean, to be a statist, to be in favor of the state at the expense of the individual. It doesn't matter if you're a tech statist or a, a mom and pop local organic grocer state. I mean, statism of any sort, incompatible with respect for individuals' liberty. And she, this is interesting. Back in the 60s, she was writing about what she called the pull peddlers. And you know, by the time I was growing up, we were hearing a lot about lobbyists. And 10 years ago, we were hearing a lot about cronyism in, in government and you know, crony capitalism, so-called and so on. She was very prescient. And again, I think this speaks to, because she was looking at issues in principle, in their essential terms, she got that once you have a mixed economy as we had in her lifetime, right? The mix is only gonna get worse. You're only gonna have more and more government control and then people to buy some freedom for themselves have to lobby for government favor. So statism, and I mean, we see this today with some tech executives who are coming out and saying, yes, regulate us, because that's a means of self-defense given the perverted restrictions that we've already placed them under. But they do have the power to uh, silence us. That's, that's the problem. You know, I don't think they have that power. And let me actually, I don't mean to understate that. They don't have the power of government. This I think is an absolutely all important critical difference that has been confused in recent years. The difference between the power of ideas or the power of you wanna make this trade or not, right? Facebook can't silence Tara. Tara doesn't have a Facebook account. They're not taking anything from me by whatever their policies are. And if I chose to open an account with this social media company or that social media company, that would be between me and them. Now, obviously, when you have vast numbers of people using certain services, they're not gonna, those people aren't going to like it if the services aren't perfectly to their taste. But that's why we have a proliferation of services. We'll be more hands-off. We'll be more curatorial and hands-on and so on. But they cannot silence us. And I think it's so important that we respect here again, what you call things, the language that we use, identifying things properly, what is censorship, what is free speech? The fact that not everybody likes what I have to say doesn't mean my freedom of speech has been impinged. 
If the government says you will be placed in jail, Tara, or we will shut down your publication if you say that, when the government says that, it's using the power of force, of, coerce, of coercion, which is different from the power of, of the others. Sorry, I do get animated about that. <laughs> Very good. We like good. it. Uh, we're sort of getting onto the onto the cancel culture uh, thing here, and I just wondered um, if anyone on the panel has uh, some some views on that. Uh, I mean, is it is it right that we should really tear down statues of people who were uh, racist or or slave owners or, or or something like that, and and just you know forget them, uh, or is there something? The, the, in the name of free speech, no, that the, the, these people, although some of them may have been hideous, uh, that we should still recognize them. Um, can I answer uh, that one or at least have a go at it? I, I, there, there's several aspects to this. One is that uh, if you have statues that have been erected by governments themselves, or with use of taxpayers' money or public funds sequestered from the public to pay for statues honoring certain individuals or certain causes then there is an element of this being a public matter uh, and it's not simply a matter of say someone like a private landowner choosing to put up a, a statue of someone i would regard as a hero like Rod richard cobden or or ryan rand in a in a private place where no one's forced to pay for it no one's forced to go there it gets a bit where this matter gets a bit more difficult is where you have public places which are you know under ultimately under control of some kind of governmental authority like a town square where you have a, a, a statue of just take a real world example where it's become very controversial in the u.s of a confederate general like the side that lost just point that out um uh, where they, where people demand that it's taken down and actually, I have a good deal of sympathy with those who want it taken down. It's worth pointing out, by the way, that many of those statues were not put up immediately after the US Civil War, but actually in the late 19th century during the so-called progressive era, ironically enough. Um, but you also have other statues which are put up uh, at a time when people are not really worried or fixated on any particular things they've done, but subsequently people come around to take a different view. Um, I, I think where, where these things are put up with public funds or have been put up with public funds, I think there is some grounds for people being able to, through the public uh, bodies, to be able to ask for them to change. What is not acceptable on any grounds, in my view, is when just mobs of people take it upon themselves to just tear stuff down uh, and present it as a fait accompli later. I mean, I, that's that's simply not acceptable. Um, I. I there have been, obviously, and this is maybe something would be interesting to know what Rand have made of it. In the former Soviet Union, you saw examples of statues of Lenin, Stalin, various other thugs being draw, being dragged down. And I don't, and many of the people ironically getting upset about statue defacement today probably were cheering that on. So I think that um, you have to also bear in mind this point between things which have been put up in public places with public money and where things which have not. Um, but it's a difficult one to get right because there are certain things which are part of the public space, which is very difficult to see being removed in any circumstances, um, unless that would involve enormous levels of destruction. And it seems to me that there, it's difficult to know what on earth the boundaries would be. Uh, can I sort of widen this slightly to the broader council culture question? And like what Tara said earlier, the essential under this is the use of force or not. And um, you know, when, if a private university or a private organization says, we're not going to host Toby Young or whatever, Milo Yiannopoulos, that's fine. That's their right. If, if an organization says we are going to host Sargon of Akkad and then a mob breaks in and damages the building, as I personally experienced a couple years ago, um, you know, you have people being punched and sirens wailing and fires being started. That's abusing people's rights. So cancel culture in terms of, you know, if, if, you're deciding not to air a point of view, that's fine. Saying that you have the ability to control other people, using force to try and control other people, that's a violation of rights. That's the essential difference there. There's also a slight complication with universities because so many of our universities are state-owned and state-run. So a, a private organization saying they're not gonna host a speaker, as far as I'm concerned, is completely their right. But a state-run organization, that's far more complicated. 
Can I add just a few other elements? And it, it is largely by way of addition, I think. Um, I don't think the private versus public solves all the interesting and important questions here. That is, even if a private organization, a private university is perfectly within its rights in honoring whoever it wants to honor in statuary and what else, there are still questions of, should you really be honoring that character or that character? And depending on the kind of institution you wanna be, if you wanna be a certain kind of research open to knowledge and reason institution, there are people you ought not to um, idolize, okay? I would also say about the cancel culture, uh, anti-statues uh, anti in general, much of that discussion, much, not all, is incredibly ahistorical. I mean, some of the people they want to cancel are genuine heroes of individual liberty and equality in the proper sense of the word, and they should be celebrated despite certain flaws and, and errors that they made at, that they had at their time, okay? But I think more broadly than just the statue issue with cancel culture, it's such a fascinating and insidious whole idea and concept because it's, I don't wanna see those people, I don't wanna talk about those ideas, right? It, so cancel culture extends far beyond, let's take down some, some statues of no longer politically correct people. Let's shut you up, you objectivists or you capitalists or you whatever you want. Let's shut you up, let's not hear. Going back to something that Thomas Walker was saying earlier, that's not how we learn anything. It's not only not how we change people's minds, it's not how we ourselves can be educated if we're just in that narrow, claustrophobic safe space, safe from different ideas. You know, we need to hear the different, we need to hear the different ideas about Marxism, about capitalism, about vaccines or whatever. It's only through engaging that we can figure out eventually What's what, what's true, what's more valid, what's not. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Tara. We're uh, coming to the end of, um, end of our uh, hour. Uh, I, I feel we could go on for another hour very easily, but uh, we, we do re restrict it to, to an hour. Uh, so let me just say that um, uh, Tara has uh, prepared a, um, a list of references on uh, RAND, uh, some of her books and some of other people's uh, books. And um, that's available. Uh, we're going to put the, um, the contact up in the chat so you can have a look at that. And then you can access uh, uh, those uh, references if you're interested in learning more about uh, Rand and her thought. Um, uh, let me just say that uh, next week we have uh, my colleague, Dr. Madsen Piri. Uh, we'll have the, his guest will be um, Dr. Anton Howes, who's a, an expert on uh, the Industrial Revolution and invention, uh, and his uh, subject is going to be the power of innovation, and that's at uh, uh, six o'clock uh, next Tuesday, so do tune into that one. And note that the uh, webinar that you've just uh, seen will be available on Facebook and YouTube uh, from today. So uh, what I'd like to do is to thank uh, all of our uh, panelists, Tom, Thomas, and Tara, three Ts. Uh, and I think it's been a very exciting and interesting and uh, a very useful, uh, informative uh, discussion. Uh, so thank you all very much for your participation. And thanks to everybody who uh, produced questions. We, I couldn't possibly <laughs> have read them all out. I tried to do my best. Uh, but thank you all for participating. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you all.